Um, so uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to share some of my ideas. Um, I'm a, an academic at the um, University of the Western Cape in the Department of Physiotherapy. Um, and uh, a couple of years ago, I was asked to give a presentation at a, um, a research day in the faculty. And I started thinking about this idea of, of measurement and metrics and how as academics, we are often reduced to these quantitative metrics of performance, which in many cases are inadequate and inappropriate. And um, so I started looking into it. And um, I think there's, uh, we're starting to see the emergence of a trend away from these kinds of quantitative metrics uh, towards, um, uh, I guess, different evaluations of um, academic input, uh, impact, sorry, not input. So that's basically what I'm going to be talking about today, different ways to think about scholarly work um, in a digital and network environment. Um, and, and ways that we might think differently about the, the output that we do as, as academics. And I think this is especially relevant for PhD students um, because while you are at an early stage of your academic career um, as researchers, um, I think that there's a lot of space for experimentation um, as a PhD student. So just to start off with, um, just very briefly, this um, idea of scholarly practice is what I'm going to be focusing my attention on rather than a very specific um, research output. So thinking more about uh, scholarship as a practice that's more broad than just the one type of um, uh, research which we tend to privilege, and that's the, the scholarship of discovery, which is this basic research in the search for new knowledge. Um, and as you can see, this is just a Boyer's framework for scholarly practice. And you can see there are different ways to think about scholarship. And at the bottom there, that's kind of the way that I think about scholarly practice um, uh, more broadly than just thinking about research articles. It's about discovering and sharing new ideas that help other people solve problems that they care about. And so, for example, the way that we translate that into um, kind of uh, research metrics is when we say help others solve problems they care about, we look at that as like a citation count. So the number of times that you get cited, we're using that as a proxy indicator for how other people are using your research. And I think there's a lot of criticism around um, citation, for example. Um, you know, I've, I've cited many papers, um, and the only reason I'm citing those papers is because I'm making a claim in an article that I'm writing, and I need a citation at the end of the, the sentence. And so I go and I find an article that says what, what I need to say. Um, and so the, the, this gaming of, of citation as a metric, um, I think is problematic. And we, we're increasingly seeing people um, challenge those ideas. Um, I've just put a, a picture here. I mean, this is, this is traditionally what we think of as scholarly output. Um, we, we use articles as proxy indicators of our ability to influence the thinking of other people. And, and I think that if you think about your scholarly practice as a way to influence the thinking of other people, it opens up a space for you to move away from this idea of the research article as um, this end in itself. Um, it's, it's a means to an end. And what I'm going to try and say in this talk is that there are other ways, more effective ways of achieving those ends. Uh, this is just a um, this circular reasoning that we have where we think that scholarship equals more articles and that more articles equals scholarship, uh, which is not, not true. Um, if we look at what scholarship actually is, we can say that it, it, it is creative, it can be documented, can be replicated and is peer reviewed. And if you just look at those criteria, I think we can start seeing that there are a lot of different ways for us to think about scholarly practice. Even something like peer reviewed, um, if I put out a tweet, and I, maybe this isn't a great example because, um, well, it's not a great example, but just as a way of thinking differently about what peer review means, a hundred times. In some ways, that is a form of peer review. Um, the comments that I get back on that tweet is a form of peer review. Um, and so I think we can start thinking about what peer review means very differently differently um, uh, with respect to the traditional way of thinking about peer review, which is that two unknown people um, make comments about some work that I've done, and I just have to jump through whatever hoops they put in front of me. And I think that that's massive. I'll talk a little bit later about uh, some of the things that I'm doing to try and move us away from that idea of peer review. 
Um, so if we think about scholarship, not just as different ways of sharing, in other words, how else can we influence the thinking of other people? What might we do in our scholarly practice that's different to just writing more um, PDFs? Um, so if we think about ResearchGate, for example, there's a social network component where we get to connect with other people, but ultimately people are using research to share PDFs. So it's not a fundamentally different way of conducting scholarly practice. It's just a different way of sharing PDFs. Um, I should have maybe done this as a, a table so you could see it side by side. But if we look at journals as a, um, a channel for how articles spread, we see that journals serve, they have two primary features and um, would serve their aims. Uh, the one is accreditation and distribution. Um, I'll, I'll talk in the next slide about what um, alternatives we had for, for those two um, features of accreditation and distribution. Um, other features of journals is that they create artificial scarcity via rejection. Um, once you put a journal online, there is absolutely no reason for it to reject any articles other than whether or not those articles have fatal flaws in methods, which most articles don't. Um, Journals serve to silo ideas, so it's very difficult to connect those ideas with ideas in other journals. Uh, there's no attempt to embed meaning, so often these uh, journals are just collections of words, and it's very difficult to include things like semantic search because there is no metadata um, at the paragraph or sentence or, or word level. Um, PDFs are static, unstructured data, text and images, so it's very difficult for us to see exactly what it is that's inside PDFs, although search engines are increasingly getting much better at um, extracting some of that information. And with machine learning methods, they're able to provide some meaning to those articles. Um, and then another problem with journals is that you have to go to them. Well, I see it as a problem, but the journals actually want you to go to the journals. Um, they try and keep you on their site. Uh, it's not a good thing for you to be away from their site. So those are some of the, the features that um, I think are actually bugs in the system when it comes to talking about journals. If we look at a different idea, the web, um, um, and think of that as a channel for how to spread ideas. And remember, I wanna think of scholarly practice as a way to spread ideas, not a way to spread PDFs. So the web also has the features of accreditation and distribution. So search results are ranked by authority and relevance. So a PDF that's linked to a well-known journal um, that shows up higher in Google's uh, results and um, documentation and pages that are linked to university domains. So that's the ac.za in South Africa, ac.uk in the UK, for example. Those results um, have higher authority and relevance than a uh, blog, for example. And then distribution. The web um, serves a very powerful distribution function that anyone can publish at a marginal cost of zero. Um, other features of the web is that there is abundance and um, results aren't limited to specific services. So a web search will return uh, results across a diversity of um, uh, websites and domains. Ideas can be connected through hyperlinks. And so we're able to connect um, ideas uh, across different services, uh, um, different domains, different resources. The web is increasingly able to parse meaning in text um, so that it has a sem semantic structure. So we're increasingly seeing um, queries that are built around natural language. So we can uh, start asking our search engines natural language questions. And uh, you'll see, you, you should have noticed that now when you um, put in a query into Google, it returns results um, by uh, question and, and response. Um, so we're seeing um, a more semantic structure in uh, documentation on the web. H Dynamic, but it can be structured or unstructured with embedded multimedia. I think that's very powerful when it comes to sharing ideas, especially with the rise in video. Um, and the whole point of uh, the web is that it, it can send you to other places. And I'm, I'm not talking about Facebook and Twitter. They have a business model that requires that you spend as much time as, as possible on their site so that you, they can serve you ads. Um, so I'm, I'm talking about a, an open web uh, rather than a, a walled garden like um, Facebook or, or Twitter. So just if we uh, take on board this idea of the web as a means of sharing ideas, um, you know, this links very strongly to what Dan Daniela was saying about uh, open scholarship, um, but also what Sharon was talking about when she was talking about blogging. Uh, the underlying protocol of the web is called TCPIP. It's an open protocol, which means that anyone can share anything. 
uh, value is determined by the user, not the publisher. And so when I connect to someone else, that's a little tick in Google search algorithm that says that this thing has value for me. Uh, the, the publisher of the, of the resource doesn't determine uh, where value accrues. Uh, there's user control of content and ideas. You don't need to give up intellectual property when you publish on the web. I'm not talking about publishing with a journal. Um, and in many cases, you still have to give up your intellectual property. And uh, again, a little bit later, I'll talk about some, some ideas we have um, with, with some of the projects that I'm working on where authors are not required to give up intellectual property. There's no delay in publication. So your sharing of ideas is not linked to journal publication cadence. So it's not like, uh, just as any, I just had an article published a little while ago. And uh, the web version is, is public, it's live, but the print version is going to come out in three years. So in three years time, um, that's when the article is going to be published. It just starts giving you a, a flavor of how ridiculous academic publication has become. And HTML is superior to PDF for conveying ideas because content can be dynamic and multimodal. So a PDF is basically a, a really efficient form of paper, um, but it doesn't have anything in it that is, moves us away from what we can achieve with paper. It's just more efficient. Um, um, but it's this idea that counting publication and citation is a problem. And if you've heard of Goodhart's law, Goodhart's law um, is a, just a, a principle that says that when a metric becomes a target, it ceases to be an effective metric. And, and that's what we're seeing now with citation and gaming of uh, these impact metrics, is we're seeing that uh, journals and editors are starting to game the system, or they've always been gaming the system, but we're starting to recognize it more. Um, and I think this is massively problematic um, when it comes to uh, sharing ideas. And, and if that's, remember, that that's what scholarly practice is. It's about sharing ideas, not this perverse incentive of trying to ratchet up um, citation count. So the DHET um, uh, recently, they're starting to put out a, um, I think this is part of the um, uh, evaluation framework, starting to recognize creative outputs where they give equal value to empirical research and creative work. And looking at creative work as being fully equivalent to other types of research output. Um, and I think that's really forward thinking and, and interesting. It kind of shifts the conversation away from the um, article as the, um, the, the primary means of determining your impact as a researcher. We see the Royal Society in the UK and the Associated Research Excellence, Research Excellence Framework. Um, they're also starting to recognize that these two narrowly focused performance indicators make it harder to see and reward the wide range of contributions that researchers make to uh, the public good. Um, and they've re released a template for, um, uh, for CVs for researchers um, to be used in the UK. This is something that they're pushing to be taken up um, across the, the whole of the UK higher education system, where they actually ask researchers to provide a two-page statement attached to their CV where they ask them these kind of very subjective questions. How have you contributed to the generation of knowledge, development of individuals, the wider research community, and to broader society? And it's a way to move away from this kind of single metric, the um, either the journal impact factor, factor or your H index, as a way of demonstrating the effect of the research that you've done. Uh, this is just another example of um, a, a different way to uh, assess the impact of research. Um, the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment is looking at eliminating the use of journal-based metrics to assess research on its own merits and looking at capitalizing opportunities provided for online publication. So we're starting to see a trend um, in the last maybe five years where um, institutions are starting to push back against this idea that um, either journal uh, researcher or article level metrics um, are of much value. Um, having said that, this is not just an academic conversation. We just recently, uh, the University of Liverpool was looking at um, uh, budget cuts and they were wanting to fire um, about 47 um, academics and they were trying to use citation metrics as one way to try and figure out who they should um, get rid of. So this is not just a um, a, a theoretical exercise. Um, all right, I'm going to move into talking about some of the different ways that I think about uh, scholarly work. Um, and and I'll, I'll, uh, you'll see in some of the slides, I've got a number in the top right corner. Um, just 
I'm not sure that reducing some of these things to quantitative metrics um, says very much, but it does say something. Um, and, and I think for me, that is a, a really um, interesting form of feedback that you get. Um, you know, um, in some of these examples that I'm going to be sharing, um, again, it, it doesn't, I don't know what it says, but, but it's saying something. Anyway, I started blogging in 2008 when I started my PhD. Um, maybe just before I started the PhD, I said I would focus this uh, blog on a few, a few general themes, education, healthcare, and technology. Um, it's been about 13 years, and I'm still blogging about the same themes, so that seems like it was a good selection. Um, and the idea with the blog was that um, this was going to be a, a place for me to integrate ideas from those different domains, um, an experiment, a practical space to explore and to play around with different ideas. And what's nice about it is that there's, um, you know, you're free to do whatever you want. Um, there's no... Uh, uh, my my promotion application um, is is never going to be based on what's going on in my blog. So it, there's a lot of freedom um, to to experiment with blogs. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I wrote this post on um, I kind of really took apart this idea of what scholarship might look like, and so I started wondering what a podcast might look like. Um, if it was um, designed in the convention of an academic paper. And if we just kind of abstract out all of the things that we say we care about, um, you know, citation, peer review, uh, sharing, um, I think that we could make a really good case that podcasts are, are scholarly. Uh, we can embed all of the, the, uh, the usual features of uh, scholarly work into the process of creating a podcast. Um, and so we start to see that there are really interesting um, opportunities for uh, researchers and scholars to present their work in, in very different ways. Um, just the blog, um, my blog, the, that, that um, we're talking about metrics. Um, I've had 81,000 people come and read uh, what I've had to say. And given the very kind of low value that I place on some of these blog posts, um, you know, it's sometimes it's really just, you know, I had this thought um, and I just want to put that thought out there. I know how much value I get from just seeing incidental, incidental thoughts that other people post. And so I thought if one other person reads this and it, it triggers a thought for them or it uh, opens up a different way of thinking or enables them to cross a threshold that, you know, they, they weren't able to, to get to on their own, well, then it's worth putting in, putting in the time. Um, just as an example of, uh, you know, how stable these things are, uh, you can see that uh, last year, uh, you can see that things are, are generally um, the same until March, which is when the pandemic hit. And then I put out a couple of posts, which just kind of really exploded. And um, there were two or three posts and they all had to do with, um, you know, you're all shifting online. Um, you know, I, I have serious concerns about how we're going to be shifting our uh, entire higher education system on the planet. Um, we're going to shift it online overnight, and I think this is going to be a problem. Um, and so that was really interesting um, just to see that, that kind of big jump in, um, in post or in, in views. Um, I used to put all of my slides onto SlideShare. Uh, this this uh, download number is quite old. I haven't looked at SlideShare in a long time. And that has a lot to do with how I'm doing presentations now. A lot of the presentations that I do are really information low. So there's not a lot of content in the slides. Often I'll just have uh, photos. And so it's, it's just a, a photo that evokes some kind of a feeling. Um, it may have a single word or a couple of words. Um, but there isn't much value in putting those kinds of slides online unless it's accompanied by the um, audio recording. And so I'm, I'm thinking a little bit about how maybe I could include the audio recording as well. And SlideShare doesn't really include that option. Not that I'm aware of. So maybe um, I have to figure out a different way to share presentations. Uh, probably YouTube, um, if I'm honest. Um, the conversation is a really good way for academics to share their work with a broader public um, and to translate research into something that's a little bit more accessible. I think it is a really valuable way for, um, for researchers to share uh, to share ideas. Um, 
and to and to spread the um, I guess the uh, the public facing version of the research that we write. A lot of the articles that we, we write are written for our colleagues and written for other academics, and and that's obvious. The the only thing that we care about as academics, or rather the only thing that we are supposed to care about as academics is your citation counts. Members of the public are not going to cite your work. Um, so why write for members of the public? This is really perverse incentive system in higher education where the people who most need the research that we do are cut off from it because we write in a language that um, is not really uh, meant for members of the public. And I think that writing in channels like the conversation are really valuable. Um, I do quite a lot of uh, podcasting. Um, one of the things that I uh, do, uh, projects that I run is linked to the um, SAI community, SAI is the South African Association of Health Educators. And I haven't done one of these um, podcasts in a while, but what I was doing is uh, interviewing PhD researchers on the um, health professions education research that, that they were busy with and releasing those as podcasts. Uh, this particular um, colleague, uh, this podcast had been downloaded 123 times. It's now it's over 150. Um, um, but this um, conversation on her on her PhD uh, has been listened to uh, quite often. Um, I also do another podcast with a, a learning community called InBeta, where we uh, we look at uh, physiotherapy education. Um, these podcasts have been done almost four and a half thousand times. Uh, and again, I, I don't know what that metric is saying, but it's reaching uh, a reasonable community of people. Um, so what we do is we just sit down with somebody who's an interesting paper, myself and a colleague in the UK, and we just have a conversation with them. Um, to talk about their research, uh, what it is that they've done, what problem they were trying to solve, and, and look at some of the practical ways that we could implement some of the um, findings from, from that research. Uh, we also do a monthly newsletter, um, 155 subscribers, we checked yesterday. And all that we do is we, every month, we put out a newsletter and we pick a topic. Um, in August, we put out one on feedback. And so it was just um, an, an article on feedback, a, a podcast on feedback, and a resource that you might be able to use with your feedback. And so that's another, what I think is a, another form of scholarship. Um, we, we take a little bit of time to figure out what it is that we want to share. Uh, we want to find something that has real practical value for this community. Um, and it, it's a way of sharing uh, what we've learned with, uh, with, our, with our community. We also put on our conferences. Um, the first one that we did was in 2019. We had three million people show up. It was completely free, free to attend. Uh, we uh, got space at a university in Lausanne. Um, and we had 49 people come, um, many of them from countries around Switzerland. And uh, yeah, we, we just put on this art conference. And I mean, it, it really just goes to show what, what you're capable of doing. Um, it, it really is just the decision to, like, we're going to do this thing and you do it. Um, and, and I think that that's another form of scholarship that we don't really think about. Um, this, this idea of connecting colleagues, learning communities, building relationships, building networks. Um, and it's very difficult to articulate that in a CD. Um, we did the a solar idea in 2020, obviously it was in a pandemic. Um, we had 86 participants from around the world, um, and we, we just had uh, three, three days of uh, conversation, discussion around different ways of thinking about physiotherapy education. Um, so again, this, this idea that scholarship can take me forms, and it's, it's very hard to quantify this. I can say, yeah, we had 86 participants um, in, in all these different conversations, and we created different uh, resources that they could uh, use, but how do you quantify this? Um, it's, it's really difficult. Uh, we put together a series of podcasts, um, which we, we call Guided Reflections. And as part of the, um, part of the conference, we, we ask people to go and take a walk and to listen to the podcasts and to then record audio reflections while they were listening to the podcast and then share those reflections back to the community. So we kind of got people away from their desks. This, um, this idea of, of doing what you're doing now um, for you know, two or three days in a row um, is, is really soul destroying. Um, I said a little bit earlier, I'll talk about um, how I think we need to think differently about um, how we share scholarly work. 
Um, so uh, I realized that there were no physiotherapy education journals. And so I started one. Um, and uh, it's an enormous amount of effort um, to find an international uh, advisory board and editorial board, uh, peer reviewers. Um, there's a, quite a bit of technical um, background that you need to actually set it up. Um, we went with WordPress uh, to we went to create a bespoke um, publication platform. Uh, so rather than use something like Open Journal Systems, which is an open source uh, version um, of uh, journal uh, article management, um, the reason that we wanted something like WordPress uh, is because we also wanted to at some point start doing podcasts with authors, and uh, we've actually just released the first one recently. So on the left hand side, you can see just a, a summary of the publication. And on the right hand side, you can see the uh, podcast that we did with uh, this particular author. The idea is that in a podcast, we talk to people about some of the rationale for their research. Uh, they, they can dig into some of the problems that they really wanted to address. We've had one article where um, the, the reviewers said to the authors that they need to cut up like 30% of the article. So we covered that 30% in a podcast, uh, which um, I'm going to be, be publishing hopefully quite soon. The other thing I, I should mention about peer review is that we do open and transparent peer review and also um, post-publication peer review. So articles are published immediately once I go through them and make sure that they, you know, not just collection of, I don't know, Viagra ads. Um, so if, if I look at it and it's, I, you know, I think, yeah, this looks kind of reasonable, that gets published immediately, so author's ideas, again, it's about sharing ideas quickly. That article gets published immediately. It's got a, a big banner along the top that says this article has not been peer-reviewed. Well, this article is ongoing peer-reviewed. The peer reviews are published alongside the article, and the peer reviewers are not um, uh, anonymous. And, and so we feel that this creates a more collegial atmosphere um, around peer review. Um, how do you learn how to peer review if you've never peer reviewed? Um, so what we're doing is we're provide, creating this data set of uh, public peer reviews where um, you, know, you can come and look and, and see what peer review looks like, uh, which I think is quite valuable. A little while ago, um, a couple of weeks, I started a, a YouTube channel called Thinking in Public, and um, what, I'm, what I'm hoping to do with it is to just record myself trying to work through different problems that um, I think are relevant for academics. Um, and yeah, I haven't really talked about it in a, in a public platform um, up until now. Uh, so, yeah, uh, if you think it might be interesting, then go have a look. Um, or not, that's also fun. Um, but the, but the idea is that, uh, you know, I, I have colleagues who are coming to me with specific types of problems, and I realized that the way that I was working through those problems was very different to the way that they were thinking about the problems. And so I started recording um, what I do and how I work uh, in public, and, and maybe this has some utility for other academics. And then I've also started experimenting with this idea of learning communities. Um, I used to think of Twitter as a place to go to connect with people. Um, Twitter has uh, become a dumpster fire um, in, in most respects. And so um, I'm interested in looking at smaller communities, um, like a boutique community. Um, where it's not public, uh, people feel invited. Just try, try to experiment with kind of really high quality, in depth conversation um, where uh, we can experiment with different ideas. And this is something that um, I've, I've started a little while ago. Um, I'm probably going to be moving my, I've moved my, my research focus almost entirely into artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, I'm going to be spending most of my time in that. And so this is a, a learning community where we are talking about um, AI and machine learning in healthcare and higher education. Um, I think that learning communities are another way for us to develop scholarly practices um, where we can share ideas, influence the thinking of others. So in conclusion, um, I think we, it's a problem, it's a bug in the system where we think of articles as an end point in a process that starts with a proposal. I think we need to recognize that articles are means to an end and that they are better, more efficient, more effective, more collegial, more collaborative ways to achieve those ends. Um, I think the purpose of scholarship is to push boundaries and that this is not most effectively done through the publication of PDFs. Um, 
And I think there's enormous creative potential in exploring alternative forms of scholarly work. And I hope that this has been useful as a way to stimulate some thinking around different ways to conceptualize scholarship in, in higher education. That's it. Thank you very much. I, I apologize for maybe taking a little bit longer than um, I had time for.